All right. Welcome back to another episode of The Forge. Right up the road from us, we have our guest, Rourke Denver. We're so excited to have you on the show today. We have literally been talking about you for quite a long time, and uh, I, I actually just re-watched your starring role movie from 2012 about oh three days ago. Yeah, yeah I, I'd yeah. seen it before. I, I wanted yeah. to watch it again. So Active Valor, you know we got to talk about it. Sure. Um, uh, I think all of the actors, and correct me if I'm wrong, but all of the main actors in that movie were active duty SEALs, yeah? All the SEALs were active duty SEALs on orders, just like you know are not <laughs> invitations. It is you are going to go do this, and it's pretty weird to have a set of orders that I've saved in case any investigation comes up, you know, congressional comes up. I have orders that say, you know, to produce, uh, you know, feature film you know, recruiting, it's got some little weird line in there, but yeah, we're, we're put on orders to make the movie. What? That, see, this is news to me. I mean, Ron yeah. was just telling me about it. And I said, I had no idea that they act, the, the, the Navy actually said, here's your next assignment. I'm not sure if the Navy would admit it now. I think once it went nuclear, you know, when, when, when it, well, obviously after we made it, I mean, none of us had made a movie. We make the movie. We figure, of course, it's going to go directly to a bin at the bottom of a Walmart DVD, like back alley. <laughs> like that's the best it's going to do. And then it becomes like the number one movie in America. And I think everybody up like up through sec death was like, wait a minute, we did what? Even though everybody was briefed. Uh, I, I think it kind of hit people sideways and it, it was, I mean, it was a unique, unique experience. I mean, when they, the, the, the Genesis was, you know, we were in a little bit of a recruiting depression and as you know, well, you know, you sometimes have, you know, peaks and valleys where you've got more people going out than coming in based on, you know, just timing and accessions and the way all that works in the military. And so, you know, we had more workload than we've ever had as a community, obviously. And so we're like this, this Delta, we, we have to fix. And so it was trying to figure out how to, more than anything, the film crew had come in to sort of do some updated footage for our website. And then through that, a conversation um, somewhere made it to somewhere important where there's like maybe something better to be done. The, the directors came to interview a bunch of us that were at the training center. So all of us are back as SEAL instructors at the basic training compound. You're not in a deployable position. You know, we'd be there and it's all, it's at that point, it's all combat vets, you know, phenomenal guys that are there. And they just did interviews to kind of understand the mindset of SEALs, the purpose, the reason, the families, all that. They were going to go, you know, cast Vin Diesel or whoever to be, you know, a lead character and make a movie. And they finish those interviews. They're like, I think it's going to be easier to teach SEALs to act than actors to be SEALs if we want to get it right. And so um, <laughs> they asked us to do it. We all said no to a man individually said no. And then it just kind of developed from there. And once, once we got a better sense that they really did want to make it authentic and tell our story well and not put a bunch of BS in there. Like, you know, we said, look, snipers miss, people fall. There's comedy and horror that all unfolds and we try and keep a good sense of humor about it. And and, and they were great about honoring that. So it, uh, it ended up being a fun project that I still have, you know, probably two sides of my personality that I'm happy I did it. And one side that I'm like, why did I do that? <laughs> yeah. Well, th that's fascinating to me because, you know, I always thought if you're an active duty SEAL, you try to conceal your identity as much as possible. I mean, even pictures I've seen, yeah. you know, when you black out the faces. Somebody's so I, I, I just thought it was weird that they would say, okay, let's make a blockbuster movie with active duty SEALs. So, well, you know what we joked about after the fact was like, I think it might be an advantage. Like, I mean, imagine if, if one of the bad guys, like in a Taliban compound had seen the movie, you know, we come around the corner, maybe they're like, oh, that's. I think I recognize these guys. That just might give us a drop in the gunfight, you know? <laughs> so, um, no, other than, I mean, most of the guys were kind of at a point in their path where they were kind of on either a down cycle. Several guys went back to the assault teams from there. I was at a point where I'd somewhat promoted out of doing the fun stuff and was kind of moving on the executive, you know, kind of phase of my career. And um, I think the personal security side, we just kind of like, look, we're probably already all on a kill list somewhere in some, you know, some cave. And that's just the life we live. And, you know, frankly, somebody wants to come get some exercise in at my house. I'm, I'm armed and ready for that uh, for that <laughs> afternoon. But um, I figured we're low hanging fruit. You know, if you want to go, you want to go do something horrible in this country, pick, you know, pick an easier target than us. So uh, hopefully it holds true. But, yeah, it was an interesting experience for sure. I, was it was it pretty realistic? I'm sure you've been asked you know, that question a hundred times. Yeah, but. I mean, what we tried to do is make it authentic 
but obviously not give a playbook to our end, right? right so right. anytime we do an assault or something, we get to review the footage, both us and some of the senior leadership. And we'd say, hey, you, you need to like take that angle away. They don't need to see what happened on that side of the door. And we, we, we manage that as well. We didn't use, you know, some of our top, I don't know, you know the deal. The X's and O's on the battlefield are less secret than people realize. It's more technology and intel-driven stuff, and how we how we find targets. That's probably a little bit more secretive than the, you know, how do we go through a door and get the job done. But we were real circumspect on making sure we didn't give anything away. We didn't want to give away. The reason it's called Act of Valor is all the major events. You know, somebody getting shot 27 times and walking to the helicopter, somebody jumping on a grenade. That was a teammate of mine. It was all real events, kind of pulled out of our communities history and uh or, or you know very real world um moments and and we tried to pay you know tremendous reverence to that and, and you know honor the folks that had done done that job and and so yeah i mean i think it was pretty authentic i, th I think hollywood can't help itself they always have to add a twist or a turn or something extra but it didn't go crazy you know it didn't go crazy like you know marcus is a uh, latrell is a buddy of mine you know, of course, in the movie, Mark Wahlberg makes a movie and they have to make him flatline at the end. You're like, it wasn't gnarly enough on its own <laughs> that you had to add him like, beep, you know, on the table dying. That didn't happen. I mean, Marcus got tore up, but he didn't flatline. So it's like they can't help themselves. They got to throw in a little. But um, they didn't go too far off the reservation. Well, that, that's that's there's a couple things there. Number one, that, that's pretty cool to, to in the, the back story, which a lot of people maybe not know, is actual real stories about yeah. real, real soldiers. So that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I got to be honest, the, the, the scene where the gunboats come in, I was like, they that's, the show. that's, oh, that's okay. pretty cool. <laughs> That they was steal pretty the show. Cool. Yeah. And the best part was we're getting ready to do that scene. And, you know, we work with those guys all the time. They come with a mini gun, shoot over our head, you know, just like a laser gun. And we had this, uh, this film guy come out and he's got the camera, you know, with the water housing and he's like going to get in the water with us. And he comes up to me. He's like, Hey, you're in charge. Right. And I was like, I am, I am. He's like, so, um, they're going to be shooting real bullets at us. I said, well, not cause that was live fire. That was all live rounds. Really? And I was wow. like, well, not at us. But not at us, above us. Whoa. He's like, you're okay with that? I was like, they haven't hit us yet. We'll see what happens. <laughs> and we filmed that first scene. And then you got to film every scene like three times. On the second scene, we we're doing it. We're like, man, where is that guy? He must be reloading the camera. He was like across the river. was like, I got all the footage I need in the first round, boys. I'm not getting in the water I'm again. Good. He wanted nothing yeah. to do with round two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He wanted nothing to do. Uh, well, to me, that was that was the most impressive scene in the, in the movie. So that was cool. Oh. So – Work. Yeah. Um, one thing I, I picked up, I, I, I read, I feel like I'm a, a SEAL fanboy, but I read a fair amount of books about the SEALs. And one of the ones I read was First Fast, Fearless by uh, former Navy SEAL Ed Heiner. Um, and in that book, he introduced me to this idea of the ethos. And he talked about it uh, early on in the book. And I go, wow, this is this is pretty cool. And then I read the Navy SEAL yeah. ethos. And I was like, wow, that's, you know, you read the, if, if anybody, go out and read the Navy SEAL ethos. It's a, it's a powerful document, in my opinion. And so yeah. I got on this kick of, I teach leadership at, at the university. And all of my students have to do a personal ethos. And so oh, I, I walk that. them through that exercise. And I know you have one on your website. And I read through it. Why, I mean, why do you do that, number one? And what's, what's important about that? And how do you use your ethos? Well, let's start with what yeah. is an ethos? Yeah. For people that well, may not I, know. I, I'll tell you a little bit of the genesis of the SEAL ethos even. But, you know, I mean, an ethos, I think, is some form of a guiding document, either for a group of people, an individual, whether that's a large organization or, or just you, that somewhat codifies what you stand for, what you believe in. You know, if you take the, you know, the old coat of arms that, you know, old, old uh, European families would have, they'd usually have something in Latin that would talk about, you know, first to the fight or, you know, value family, whatever it might be. It's something that like, hey, this is important to us. And then I think you flesh that out if you, in my mind, do it right and take the time to expand on that and come up with those things that are non-negotiable, what we believe in, what we don't believe in, however you want to write it. The genesis of the SEAL ethos was interesting because the, steel, the SEALs are still, even though we've been so thrust into the modern limelight, um, kind of babes on the, you know, the military 
chessboard. You know, I mean, we're, we, we really had a coming out party in Vietnam. I mean, JFK established us in the early 60s. So in military terms, based on, you know, the Marines and the Navy, you know, they could trace their legacies to the founding of this country, you know, 1775 and so on. Rogers Rangers, you know, the original Rangers, the Ranger Creed is still built off these principles from, um, you know, Rogers Rangers, which one, you know, the founding of the country. And, and so the Rangers had the Ranger Creed, um, SF or Green Berets, they had, uh, you know, an ethos, all the elite and, and men and most of the, just the conventional units in the army, I can't speak to the Air Force, but had a credo or a mantra or something that kind of codified what they believed in. And I work for one of our SEAL admirals as what's called a flag lieutenant. You're basically just making sure he gets the meetings on time and has a cup of coffee when he needs it and manages his schedule. It's a terrible job, although you get to be a fly on a wall for amazing meetings. I was sitting in the meeting when Rumsfeld was talking about, you know, the Iraq war strategy and this, I mean, just amazing, amazing things wow. to see as a young lieutenant, you know, young uh, 03. Um, but one of the senior army officers, a general was talking to our admiral and they kind of got in a little heated debate being like, he's like, you guys haven't even written out what you care about, what you stand for. I mean, you're exceptional on the battlefield, but you haven't even taken the time to do that drill. And because of that, we, we sent, you know, 50, 80 of our best officer enlisted out to San Clemente Island to kind of, you know, be sequestered out there and sort of write it down. Like, what do we, what do we stand for and what's important to us and what do we want every young lion that's coming up to aspire to, you know, join this, this warrior culture to, you know, understand, adhere to, hold themselves to a standard and so on. So that was the genesis of the SEAL ethos. And, and I think they got it right. On my website, as you, you identified, um, I kind of write just like a teaser ethos. I have my own. I didn't want to share it totally with the world. And we sort of have a family ethos that we build. I think of these documents as living documents. I, I think there's things within the ethos that I've written that will never change. I mean, without question, these are elemental. I'm never going to change my position on that. Although I don't think you die on a hill like Custer, so you should keep your mind open. But I think you also very much try and figure out, look, the world's changing. My beliefs have changed. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 47 years old and the person I am and the way I think about the world is very different from the 37 and the 27. So I'm sure that'll be the case at 57. So I, I, I constantly kind of water that idea of, of, of thinking, is there something that needs to change? Is there a nuance that I could, I could do better? Um, but I think it's just a great drill for people to, um, you know, something about when you write it down, it's like you talk to, I mean, most high impact leaders, when they talk about their goals, there's a whole lot of them that have it written down. They don't just have them living out and living out in the, the ether, you know, they, 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 they put it on paper and say, I'm going to work towards that. And I'm sure you two are the same. I mean, I've got quotes up on my dry erase board. I keep a pen for my mirror in my, you know, bathroom where I'll write up little things that I'm thinking of something I want to achieve. And, you know, when it's there, it makes it real, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to have all my students listen to that clip right there. I couldn't have said it better. That, that's cool. great. Let's, yeah. let's, let's build on this. You know, um, as I said, I, I think the seals have a, a powerful ethos with recent, unfavorable headlines and, and i'm gonna uh, maybe i should put unfavorable headlines in quotes i guess it depends on who's interpreting it and where sure. it's coming from but with recent unfavorable headlines coming out about the seals the seals doing things that quite honestly they've never done before you know sometimes seals talking when they when they in the past they hadn't do you think the the seals have strayed from their ethos yeah i mean it's um you know, I'll never talk poorly, obviously, about the, the uh, you know, currently the brotherhood or the warrior culture, um, because I felt so privileged and humble to be a part of it. I also think one of the mistakes um, elite units, elite organizations make is sometimes sometimes they don't air their dirty laundry or sometimes they circle the wagons and, and defend something that probably shouldn't be defended. It should be, you know, a mea culpa. We made a mistake. That's, you know, we did it wrong. We acknowledge it. We're not going to do it again. We're going to endeavor to, you know, press forward and do it better. So I think that's important. Um, what you find, I think, when it comes to these type issues is it's usually um, a small out group, an outlier that, that has strayed from the path and has just made either an error in judgment or an error in character that, um, you know, you have to suffer because we play on the national and international stage. Look, you're making a mistake as a Boy Scout leader in 
you know, South Dakota or something, it's probably not making ha national headlines. You make a mistake on the battlefield, an elite tier, top tier unit that the world is now watching on a 24 hour reporting cycle, or even when you're back home trying to, uh, you know, make decisions as you transition from that job, you're going to have people that are going to, that are going to err and are just going to make mistakes. And I, I think what I always hope in those situations is, is that the senior leadership gets their hand around it, hits the pause button, says, Hey, Let's take a breath. Let's talk this through. Let's understand what happened. Let's make sure we don't repeat it and keep driving forward. And, and you know, no, nobody's made it through this whole game without a black eye. So um, I don't know if there's any, you know, straying from the ethos. I do think, um, you know, the generations change, things move forward. We've been at war for two decades. No one has experienced this in this country. There are countries for whom they've been at war for perpetuity. Some of our enemies have for sure. And, um, you know, it's, it's intense peaks and valleys of guys that I got early fighting in the war. By our standard, I felt very lucky because I got to turn over every rock and hit a bunch of targets and do it at the most aggressive level of the game. You know, there's young guys that just hope to get in the fight and don't know if it's going to happen. Politics and the whims of war seem to change constantly. So um, I don't think we've strayed culturally. I think uh, you're always going to have a couple of, you know, folks that give you a black eye and you, you hope to survive it. And I think there's, uh, it's safe to say there's a lot of, even from coming from a prior service member myself, there's a lot of stereotypes about what we think the the navy seals are what they stand for yeah. what type of people become seals what your day-to-day -day life is like i know i've heard you talk about that on on the internet before um yeah. what do you think some of the misconceptions are or what do you think people think seals are with uh now that you've been out of the service what have you come across where yeah. you just think oh my gosh that's what people think i was doing yeah um I think it's uh, I think it's a little all over the map. I mean, I, th I think there's look, there's a bunch of people that are no fan of the military, the police. I mean, in a current lexicon, you're like, oh, my goodness, what everybody's dealing with to do these jobs is otherworldly. Like they didn't have enough weight on their shoulders already. Now they're getting picked apart by armchair quarterbacks and, and folks that you know don't know what it what it's like to, to shoulder their boat burdens are, are, are obviously not willing to volunteer themselves to go to do the job, but they're more than willing to complain about it. Um, I, I think people have a belief that everybody is just a supreme elite athlete, a little bit of a kind of terminator, berserker, singularly focused, um, bloodthirsty killer. I think there's a bunch of people that, that just think we're out to, uh, you know, take scalps. We have those guys. I mean, we have people that, that are almost machines, but, but very, very few. Most of our guys are highly intelligent. I mean, the, the, the raw intellectual horsepower in our organization is somewhat otherworldly, enlisted an officer. And I, I've been around, I mean, Marines, Army, Air Force, say, I, like everybody. And I have respect for everybody. The raw intellectual creative horsepower that exists within our, our culture and our organization is, is otherworldly. I mean, I, I had enlisted guys that had master's degrees, let alone college degrees. And, and I never felt like the smartest person in the room. And I, 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 I'm not going to cure cancer, but I'm no dummy. But I'd be like, wow, there is some genuine, genuine uh, intellectual horsepower here that we get to tap into. We have... On the outside, I think particularly for other military units, it looks like a very cavalier way that we relate to one another, uh, rank and names and, and yes sirs and no sirs and um, you know intense, intense discipline, whether it be via uniform or the way we look at the battlefield, uh, we do not paint by numbers. It, it, there is no playbook, nothing is out of bounds. You come up with a creative idea, uh, it is going to get listened to. And if it wins and rises to the top, we'll, we'll, we'll use that in a fight. I mean, one of my guys came back from a visit to the San Diego Zoo and said, I just talked to a zoologist. He said, chimpanzees can, you know, sense explosives. We'd start te teaching chimps to jump the next day and bring them on target if it gave us an advantage. Like we just wow. really adhere to that level of creativity. I think it drives other units crazy. And I don't think we're particularly well liked in the military. I mean, I, 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 I say that with not a lot of, you know, woe is me, woe is us. I, I just think a lot of people are like, those guys are operating on a different plane and in a way that doesn't fall into kind of the, the standard picturesque version of a disciplined unit, even though I've, I've seen 
intense, intense discipline, focus and drive of all our guys. It's just the way we've built that culture. It's unique. And I wouldn't, I don't think it'd work for everybody. It works for us. Um, so I, I don't know if people appreciate the, the, the creative and intellectual horsepower that we're looking for. It, it's easy to find this. It's easy to find that. It's not hard, easy to find a creative problem solving, will not quit no matter what you throw on them. People with almost an irrational belief in their ability to win. And if you have an irrational belief in your ability to win, you got a way better chance of winning than not. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So this is a fascinating thing to me. One of the things, if I uh, I may I may miss the you know miss misspeak on this quote, but I think in the in the seal ethos it says we will we expect to lead and be led. And so you guys have this idea. And correct me if I'm if I'm getting this wrong, but I, but I sure. think you were just touching on this that the idea that whoever has the best idea will take the lead, and I wonder to myself. I think it's fascinating that yeah. that 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 you can be so fluid and so adaptable that you can do that. And I always wonder, could we reproduce this in you know in the civilian business world? Can yeah. we can we create teams that all right? You are you know you know person A is actually the the formal leader. But if person B has more expertise in this area, then person B steps to the lead. Do you think that could work in, in a civilian business situation? You know, it probably depends on the business. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a huge – my job in, in the SEAL teams was the lead. I got to jump out of planes hundreds of times, blow things up, take long-distance shots, throw grenades, dive, do everything we get to do. That was not my job. My job was to manage and orchestrate the chaos. It was to rally and marshal the troops and those ideas put it into a, you know, kind of cogent set of steps that I could brief to higher command, get approved, and then manage the insanity on the battlefield. Now, none of my guys ever need to crack the whip. I was usually pulling the rain backs, reins back with my guys because they're so intense in the way they attack the battlefield. Um, but I think succinct, pretty almost undeniable leadership in a role is not something you want to have a carousel of, but that's, that's in our line of work. I don't think the carousel is the right way to do that. What, the nuance of what I mean within our organization is the best idea rise to the top. It doesn't mean, you know, if my most junior guy came up with the best idea, it comes up, okay, well now you're in charge of tonight's mission. Oh, okay. It'll just be like, look, we're going to use that. That's going to get folded in. I'm going to figure out a way to brief it. We're going to rehearse it and let's go do it. Um, when I talk to a lot of, I mean, my, the, the base of my pyramid are doing corporate kind of consulting, speaking events, and and kind of helping leaders, you know, either through executive coaching or, or or talking to them about the way they're leading their teams to you know give them some of the concepts and principles I learned in very intense environments. Um, one of the major things I I, I try and in, in in part on them and and get them to do is to get out of their corner office, get amongst the troops, really listen to what people are saying. You know, sometimes you get caught out in the top of the flagpole foot pole or in the C-suite and you think an organization's doing well and it's that train's going off the tracks and everybody knows it but you because they're not going to come talk to you about it. So I, I talked to them about having kind of Viking councils where it's like, look, you need to have your senior leadership. You need to have a couple people from marketing, a couple people from the comptroller office, get somebody from the mail room, get at least one gen Editor, and then have a meeting with all of them and figure out what's going on in your organization and, and really listen, make it like non-attributional, which takes tremendous, tremendous maturity. So I, I, I say, you got to be careful on this. If you get some junior person that's going to say, Hey boss, you, you know, you're the emperor, emperor, not wearing clothes. You got to be a big person to deal with that and metabolize that. But if you can, you're going to have such a pulse on what's actually taking place and really understand what's going to make that engine run well, that you're going to be better for it. And, and then once you're good at kind of getting the information, then as a leader, it's your job to really, um, you know, I don't know, figure out that vision, figure out the direction and then just drive, drive the train, you know, but be willing to be willing to make course corrections as you go. It, it's, it's art, not science. Anybody that tries to write a book, that's like, you should be this leader. You should be this style leader. I'm like, give me a break. Everybody's a different personality. There's non-negotiables, but in general, I've seen, I mean, I've seen tyrants screaming maniacal leaders that were horrible to work for. They were exceptional leaders. And I saw the same personality just be a, a, an absolute disaster. That, that command fell apart. I saw real cerebral, circumspect, quiet leaders that still were able to manage a fantastic team. And the same personality trait, not work. So when I talk to leaders, I'm like, look, be the best version of, of the leader you are. Don't, don't try and be somebody else. The last thing you want to do is if you're 
you know, a quiet cerebral type, try and be Norman Schwarzkopf. You know, that's not going to, that's not going to be your, your spot. So do, do the best version of you and uh, you got a better chance of success for sure. For sure. Well, this might go for leadership as well as people in general, but um, I, I've heard you talk a little bit about how we, and Ron and I talk about this a lot as well, how society in general, let alone potentially leaders in, in leadership positions, have gotten a little soft, Yeah. right? And, and you're kind of an old school uh, Colorado man, you know, you're yeah. out there yeah. in the elements and <laughs> yeah. uh, doing yeah. what us Coloradans do. And, um, and I know you've spent a lot of time hunting in um in alaska which is actually yep. where i learned to hunt as well what a great oh, i love it that man i'd love to talk to you about that a little bit yeah. today too. but um you've mentioned that you feel that society today is a little bit uh you have a lot of words but i'll use congested and yeah. loud yeah. what do you mean by that I, I just think we're we're in a weird time i mean we it, it's like you get to this level of advancement and technology and comfort to where you can legitimately encapsulate yourself in, I mean, you can go from a climate controlled house to a climate controlled car that you started from inside your house and then go to the same office back to those two go home and, and never even feel the wind on your face, you know? And so what, what we know is, and, and you know, you two know this in spades, but you know, most people I think would agree, nobody jumped up and celebrated doing something easy. I mean, when you get something done and easy, you're just like, okay, done. But, and it might be pleasurable, um, but it's the hard things that you look back on fondly. It sucks when you're doing it. It's hard when you're doing it and it's almost miserable. And, you know, you, you're probably going to hit ridge lines where you want to quit. But when you do something hard and you push yourself and you get out of your comfort zone and you, you suffer a little bit, you get to the end line of those things. And you're like, all right, give me more. That's where the good stuff lives. That's where the lessons are. That's where the, you know, the, the failures and the missteps and stubbing your toe. And, and, and frankly, the good stories come, nobody has a good story that works in, <laughs> you know, whatever, uh, some, you know, kind of, I don't know, middling job where you just trudge to work every day, type away at a computer and then trudge home. You know, it's people that are out hunting and flying planes and getting adventures and putting themselves in harm's way. Those are the people that, you know, you want to listen to their stories at the bar, or the, you know, the, uh, the, the wedding reception or something like that. So I've tried to live that life more than, than the life of, uh, uh, you know, of comfort because, uh, and, I, and I like relaxing with the best of them, but I feel best when I'm going hard and when I'm getting beat up and, you know, I kind of feel the sting of things on my face. So I, I just think, we can avoid pain. You can avoid pain almost utterly at this point. And it's a mistake. It's a mistake. Pain's where the growth is. I want to make that arm stronger. I pick up a bunch of heavy stuff. I tear a bunch of muscles, all these magical little things come in there and fix it. I do enough time. It just gets stronger. I mean, it's very simple. It's very simple. It's not easy, but it's very simple. <laughs> is it, uh, are you teaching your kids this, this way of life, even though yeah, we're living we in this digital, easy world? Oh, no, you know, our kiddos don't have phones. They're not on, um, the network as much as mo some people are. And every once in a while, I'm like, man, I hope I'm not putting them in a, in a hole, but I don't think it's the case. My, my two kiddos can have, uh, they're 10 and 12. They can have a conversation with adult where I'd say most, any average adult is going to be outmatched by their, like. <laughs> charisma yeah. and ability That's to hold great. a conversation. They'll look you in the eye. They'll ask you questions. They'll talk about topics. They go to a fantastic school. Some of the things they bring home, I'm like, oh, I do not think I was thinking or discussing that when I was in sixth grade. No way. And so, yeah, they're just engaging kids. And, and you know, we love our family. They love being with us. And I hear these parents like, oh, your kids are going to hate you soon. And I'm like, not so sure. We have a good time. You know, we, it, we, it used we, to work back in the day. So we've cultivated you know, it, it. We've cultivated it. Yeah. Do the kids yeah. not care? I'm just curious. Do they, are they, they don't, they don't know they're missing anything. I don't think so. I That's don't think amazing. so. And look, they have other friends that have anxiety and stress yep. and problems. Yep. Yeah, I mean, yeah. One of the things is actually tough. We're, we're actually sort of realizing that our eldest, um, a lot of her friends are actually one grade under the school they're at has multiple grades kind of together. And some of her friends are young, one, one or one grade under where she was. I was like, man, is she like delayed socially? I don't know if it's a good idea. And then my bride and I are sitting there one night. I was like, you know what it is. And I think she figured out before I did, she's like, she's not advancing way beyond her age. And these mm -hmm. other kids with exposure to probably, you know, who knows the untold number of things they're seeing on YouTube up into porn and they're like right, right. getting nuked as young people and can't handle it. And like, my kid still likes playing make-believe and like with <laughs> toys and dressing up. And you're just like, you know what? You got a lifetime to be an adult. 
you, you can be a kid for a lot longer. So yeah, I, I like where we're at with them. And, and um, yeah, I mean, look, if they're trying to tie their shoes, I don't, I don't help them. I mean, I taught them how I'm like, you got to tie your shoe. Like, I, you know, the only way you're going to learn to do it is to do it. And, and, you know, there's times, I mean, if they, they definitely know if they say I can't, we're there until you do. So knock yourself out. If you want to say, I can't, we're going to be staying here all night until you like prove to yourself you can, and you will maybe a hundred tries. And then we're going to go home and you're going to hate me for a day. And then you're going to realize you can do things on your own. Yeah. It's, it's a, uh, it's a weird path we're on right now. Culturally. Well, yeah, it is a weird path. And, and of course, as Tara said, that's, we're passionate about it. You know, our, our kind of one of our, our little mantras is do hard things. So, yeah, clearly, I, you know, do hard things, man. Yeah. I yeah. had a question about, you know, suffering and adversity. You just answered all of it. You know, why should yeah. we do this? Why should we seek out, you know, those challenges, that adversity, that suffering? Well, you just answered it. I always say, you know, it's not my words, but the, the one with the best stories wins. And so yeah. go out there and make some good stories and, and mix it up and have a little adventure. And I love that you're teaching your kids that because yeah. I think that's going to serve them well. Let me let me turn this a little bit. Um, my hangar mate, who also, which is, is kind of funny, my, my hangar mate is a former F-15 fighter pilot. He also calls his wife his bride, which, nice. which is kind of interesting that you do yeah. that as well. We talked one time, um, and I said, his name's Bob, and I said, Bob, do you think that we can learn to perform well under pressure, or is that something we're born with? He said he thinks we're born with that. Now, again, this is coming from an F-15 fighter pilot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's seen a little bit of this. What yeah. are your thoughts on that, Rory? Can we? I mean, you, you were in this kind of industry too. Performance yeah. under pressure is, is a pretty big deal for a SEAL. Do you think we can develop that, or is that you either have it or you don't? I, I, I hope it's not a cop out. I think it's a little bit of both. I, I mean it sincerely. I, I think um, there, I think there's almost nothing you can't train to. That that's just real. I mean, you know, if, if Al Qaeda is training their youth to, you know, decapitate those people that live in Israel, they're gonna learn to cut the heads off somebody in Israel. I can't imagine I've done some pretty savage stuff against bad guys. I can't imagine physically cutting someone's head off. And so they train to that at a young age. So they're going to grow up with the capacity to do so, which is horrific. But I feel like there's almost nothing you can't train and discipline yourself to do. Um, I also think people are born with, you know, traits or proclivities towards managing anxiety and stress and, you know, sort of understanding that fear exists and, 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 and managing and handling that fear. Um, I think fear is just one of those great subjects and, you know, people are like, Oh, you guys are fearless. I'm like, I haven't seen a fearless person on the battlefield that succeeded. If you're fearless, you're going to be reckless. You're not going to do well. It's the people that manage fear that are able to kind of, uh, you know, manipulate their system, whether it's through breathing or practice and repetition to kind of be afraid and, you know, put your boots on anyway. Um, so I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, the thing I'll say for sure is that, um, we train so intensely, you know, for gunfighting and, and mortal combat that the first time and in a very visceral, realistic way, real looking targets. I mean, the old school, like circle target that like World War Two soldiers shot at, that's long gone. They knew the psychology didn't work because no like square or circle came running at you on the battlefield. It was a human with a gun. So now all targets we shoot at there, they look like real pictures of a human and you need to kind of have that built into your, you know, almost your, your mammalian brain that you're like, this is what I'm going to be shooting at. And let's practice that. The first time somebody jumped out around a corner and, and shot at me with AK 47 was not the first time it had happened. I'd seen it thousands of reps before. So it was almost like mechanical to respond to that threat. Afterwards, you got to metabolize you know, you just took somebody's life and, and, and deal with that however you want to deal with that. And everybody does that, I think, a little bit different. But we trained to such a high level performance that we were just kind of ready for the situations that came. And I think he'd agree, um, the pilot would agree that um, the one thing we saw on the battlefield is one of my favorite things to talk about with, with clients is I, I didn't really ever see people rise to the occasion. You saw people degrade to their level of training. So it's like once bullets started flying and that stress and that huge like adrenaline dump hits your you know central nervous system, most people kind of zero out and do what they practice. I didn't see people do exceptional things that they hadn't already kind of trained to that standard of. So I talk about it with, with civilians and corporations. I'm like, train hard and train real and train harder than you're probably going to see in the, the actual fight. And you'll be fine when it comes. If you don't, if you duck it and then something comes hard, good luck. Train us right now, Rourke. 
Give us a little bit of uh, um, some of the training that you've given in corporations, uh, a little bit more civilian style. How can we perform better, do you think? If you were training us right now, yeah. how can we perform better under pressure in just everyday um, activities? And one of them, I know you do a lot of public speaking. Uh, <laughs> huge fear among pretty much everybody is public speaking. So yeah, even something right, right. that's that simple. Yeah. How can we do well, better? And that, you know, that talks a little bit to what, what, what Ron's actually is that like public speaking is one of those strange ones where most people would rather, rather walk naked through a mall than speak in front of 400 people. Right. It's one of those things I always enjoyed. It just doesn't bother me. Like I, I've, I had an event in Atlanta that was called LeaderCast, a huge single day leadership event. I think there was 5,000 people in the room and my bride was with me. She's standing right off stage and was looking out. She's like, you're not nervous at all. And I'm like, I'm not, it just, I don't feel that. That's not how that um, hits me. But if you asked me to sing karaoke, I'd be like sweating, sweating the load. You know, I wouldn't want to do that, that in front of another human and she can sing. So it's like, look, we all have those things that we naturally gravitate to and have comfort in. Um, you know, when it comes to in the civilian world, I, I like to do it through stories. I mean, I just think stories is how, you know, ancients and philosophers and the, you know, the Stoics and the, you know, the, the Native American grandfathers and all these, these great, you know, kind of sages taught, principles. You know, they'd tell stories with a moral or a great punchline and the story would really illuminate uh, the teaching point. So I don't know, I got tons of them and a lot of powder to burn. I'm trying to think of a quick one so we don't burn too much. One that I talked about recently was I was talking to a company that was having a real hard time, particularly in the time of COVID with, with people kind of returning and working out, uh, you know, uh, distance and, 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 you know, virtually uh, somebody was asking me about, you know, we're trying to get our people to, you know, do the kind of tactical, you know, the, the day to day, but still keep an eye on the strategic vision. And they'd acquired a company and they're really going. And the story reminded me of one that I've really enjoyed kind of looking at. A lot of people know this first part. They probably won't this, know the second. Um, JFK's president, he's told the world we're going to put a man on the moon within 10 years. He meant it. And he never visited NASA. So he goes to a visit to NASA. All the senior leadership at NASA, um, you know, basically give him the, the, you know, the presidential tour. Talks to the engineers, the actual astronauts, uh, astrophysicists, all the leadership, incredible. He finishes those briefs and then he's got to go to an operations center where he's actually going to see some of the training. And from the story, it sounds like he had to walk down this long, long hallway, call it a you know, 100, 200 yard hallway to get to the other training facility. And he steps into this hallway and the floor is the most beautiful, polished, perfectly clean floor he's ever seen. And at the end of the hallway, he sees a janitor that's actually working on the floor. I'm sure NASA was appalled that they had a janitor in the hallway the president's walking through. But JFK goes walking up and he stops, of course, because he's an affable guy. And he talks to Janet. He's like, how you doing? They go back for us. Like, hey, great, Mr. President. It's unbelievable to meet you. And he's like, hey, you know, what's, what's your job here? And the janitor, without skipping a beat, says, my job is to put a man on the moon. And you're like, I have another part of that story and I won't waste it today. I got I to save it for some other post. But it's like, if your mindset is my job is to keep the floor clean or, or you know, what I do here is keep the floor clean, but my job is to put a man on the moon. You think that's going to be a high performing organization that everybody has that strategic vision and that, 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 that ultimate goal in mind down to your janitorial staff, that, that crew can't be stopped. That's why we put a man on the moon. And so I talk to that a lot about, you know, the corporate teams and leaders. I'm like, look, you got to have people really grind and be willing to do that day to day and the tough stuff, but make sure they know what you're fighting for and what you're heading towards. And, you, you know, I mean, being on a military base, there's all kinds of stuff I don't miss every morning when that flag would go up. I get choked up thinking about it right now. Everybody stops their car. We all take a moment to just like render respect to that flag. You're like, this is awesome. We're all in this together. End of the day, it doesn't matter what you're doing. Boom, it stops. One of the things, and, 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 and Tara, you'll know this for sure, that used to bother me is when that little chime came out. So it was like 20 seconds until the flag was going to go up and you'd see somebody run around a corner to try and get inside. I'd stand there and do it and I'd go find that person. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> You can't take two minutes out of your day to listen to that song. You can't Good two minutes you. out of day to listen to those horns play that we listen to when we put a, a, a flag on somebody's coffin. Stay out there and like take that moment. You got plenty of time to get your work done. It used to really, really bother me. But it's it's one thing I miss because in that line of work, you knew that that was the that was the mission. That was the mission. It was special for sure.
for sure. Oh, such a powerful message, especially yeah. with so many leaders listening now that uh, are struggling with exactly what you just said. I think yes. there's that struggle in general, um, but now, especially after the year that we've been through, I think for that sure. struggle is, sure. is universal. Yeah. yeah, no doubt. Yeah. yeah. And I would add what, what Rourke's talking about there. I know you're very passionate about this. I can, and, and certainly I could hear it in your words, but purpose yeah. it's right. What, what yeah, is our, what is the, what is the purpose here? That's right. And, and how many people go through life not knowing what, what why am I here? What, what am I doing? And, and what is my purpose? And so maybe that's a, a lesson that, uh, you know, I identify what that purpose is for you, whether that's, you know, the flag or, or whatever it is, yeah, uh, you yeah. know, in a corporation or, or whatever. Let's, uh, you touched, you talked about fear. I, I'm fascinated by fear as well. In your, in your ethos that you have on your website, you have something that says it is acceptable to be afraid. It is unacceptable to let fear paralyze you. I'm going to ask you a tough question here, Rourke. I don't know. We'll see if you, uh, when, when, tell me about a time, maybe the, maybe the time, can you tell us a story about being really afraid? Yeah. Is, um, I mean, it's funny and, in, 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 I'm probably more scared about, you know, making sure, you know, my, my, my girls get enough stuff, not too much and develop into a resilient, tough, you know, young, young gal with grit and can kind of manage and navigate the world, you know, when I'm, when I'm long gone at some point. Um, I don't remember dealing with a tremendous amount of fear on the battlefield, which is not to say I wasn't scared. I think we had prepped and inoculated ourselves to the fight so well that we just knew how to press and keep focusing on the job and the skill set and, and, and kind of winning the fight. One time I, I probably was as closest to being afraid was when I was in one of those spots where I didn't have control, you know, as a, as a, a lieutenant, which is an 03 kind of a tactical uh, element leader within the SEAL teams, you're going to have a couple junior officers, you know, Lieutenant JG, 01, 02, you know, Ensign in the Navy that are going to be your junior officers and they're going to become that lieutenant in the next, next wave. And your job, if you're worth your salt, you and your chief petty officer in the Navy, your senior enlisted is to to raise those young lions up and teach them the skills so they can take an assault team in the next round. And our guys are so talented. This is not a heavy lift. At the same time, you got to know when you can take the training wheels off and also just let them run with a ball. And so 2006, we're in Iraq. This is the same deployment with Chris Kyle and Jocko and all these famous seals that were on that deployment and, um, uh, you know, different assault teams, but out there at the same time. And I remember I was probably three months of the deployment. I'd run, I don't know, 150 assaults at that point, And I'd led kind of every one of them and let my junior officers do very real heavy lifting. But one of my JOs came in, he's like, Hey, I want to take a team out to do a special reconnaissance, you know, overwatch on this, you know, really dangerous neighborhood that we had been in many times and been in many, many fights and, and gone up against it. And, uh, I want to take them. Like, can I take them? I was like, yeah, it's time. Give me the brief and I'm going to make sure it's good. And then you go. Sure enough, he goes, I had another mission to run. By the time I came back, he was already out there with a team of about five guys. And the second I got back in what's called our talk or tactical operations center, they took really heavy contact and were starting to get beat up pretty good. They somehow kind of got in a bad position, just, you know, tactically on the battlefield. Um, one guy had been injured. Another, another was, uh, uh, you know, had hurt himself, you know, as they're moving. And I'm listening to this unfold on a radio and I'm not there to manage the chaos. Not like I would have done any better than he did, but this idea of having like your protege or whatever out there in harm's way, you know, when you let them go and you didn't do it. So we loaded, they weren't far from us. We loaded a Humvees and drove like absolute psychopaths to kind of respond and help them. By the time we got there, they'd won the fight. But I mean, it looked like something out of platoon. I mean, they're walking arm in arm. Guys are bleeding. They're walking up to the trucks and everybody was accounted for and everybody made it. But that was, uh, I don't know, it's probably the most scared I was on the battlefield. This idea of like, you know, I know that I know that guy's bride. I know his parents. I was going to have to go. I would damn sure go be the one that was going to go meet them when we got home deployment to explain how any one of those people didn't come home alive. And I was not looking forward to that. So that was probably, I was, I was the most afraid probably in that situation when I didn't have control. I think in general fear is one of those things that was omnipresent, but uh, I used it more as fuel than, than any hindrance. Right. It's, it's always fascinating. It's that, it's that band of brothers thing, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. You, you, you're, you're more afraid for, for the guy next to you than, than you are for yourself. 
and it's anybody, it's not SEALs. I mean, I'd see, I mean, we worked with everybody, Army, Air Force, Marines. I mean, if there'd been a Cub Scout with a rifleman's badge next to me in Al Ambar province and we were shooting at bad guys, like we're in it together. I don't care what your training was. Let's get it done and go home. You know, it's uh, it's very special. That 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 bond is is very, very special for sure. Well, we didn't get a chance to talk about the books that you have out, but uh, we'll throw those in the show notes. Damn Few, Making a Modern Seal Warrior and Worth Dying For, A Navy Seal's Call to a Nation. Rourke, tell us how people can work with you. And uh, and we're curious, what's on the horizon? What are you working on? What are the yeah, big plans? Yeah. No, it's uh, it feels like there's a lot of irons in the fire right now. I mean, I, I think... Um, uh, so ever onward is kind of my leadership consulting company that's at RourkeDenver.com, just my basic website. Um, I have something there called my commander's coffee. People can sign up for it there. I send a video a month just on a principle, a concept, a passage from, you know, ancient, uh, you know, mythology or warrior culture that I think is worth kind of unpacking and talking about. And I've got a bunch, you know, my ethos that, that we talked about is on there and at least some ideas how to do that. Bunch of content. So that, that's one space to kind of find me. And there's a place to reach out to me there to book me for a speaking event or, or um, you know, find me for uh, some consulting or executive coaching. Uh, Creative Artists Agency, which is a big talent firm in Los Angeles, they manage me for a bunch of my big stage speaking events. So CAA Speakers is a good place to find me if you're like, the corporate executive are like, we got a you know thousand person event at a big offsite and we want we want the big main stage. That's kind of the place uh, to find me there. And if, if you hit me on my site, I'll probably kick it over there. Um, the newest project is a company called High Ground, which I've, I've got the banner in the background. And this is a, a, a b- good buddy of mine that's done uh, real well in the business space. We've known each other for 15 years. And we're trying to figure out a spot where we create a company that would not only obviously create purpose and, and, and great services to the public and i'll get into that a little bit but also find a neat landing spot for special operators warriors to come have a spot to get a job and kind of work with their skill set so we do home defense um, kind of home preparedness if the war should happen we do some kind of evacuation type stuff we do corporate events and um we're having a lot of fun with it. It's one of those spots where we're going to get you out of your comfort zone and, and use some tough principles, but not the drill sergeant stuff, more of the cerebral. Let's do, let's do some tough things that you're going to enjoy and come out of it a little more inoculated for the hard things you might find in the world. And, and I think that, that, you know, that company's site goes live probably by the time this website comes out. So it'll be uh, uh, teamhighground.com www.teamhighground.com. And yeah, we got uh, all kinds of services and good content there and that ecosystem will just grow out. And so those are, uh, those are the, the, the current kind of irons in the fire. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I, I, I don't know what I want to do when I grow up yet. So I'm always kind of <laughs> trying to pretend, you know, figure out what I want to do next. And I just try and have purpose in it and do the best I can. That's, that's all right. Yeah. Dara and I are in the same boat. We're still trying to figure out what we sure. want to do too. Yeah. So, and I got to be honest, I went to your website and I'm like, Commander's Coffee. I thought you were selling actual coffee. I was going to buy some coffee. Oh. <laughs> yeah, man. I've actually, I've had a couple companies talk about doing a blend and, and that, that might still be coming. We're trying to come uh, up that'd, with uh, that'd be the right cool. crew. I want to find a veteran service, you know, coffee company to do it. And uh, there's a few big ones out there, but I'd like to find, I'd like to find a little guy that could do yeah. it. Yeah. You know about, uh, I think it's called Black Rifle Coffee. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I know those oh, guys. these guys are great. Evan Halfley and all those guys, they're incredible. They're incredible. Yeah, they're and incredible. good coffee at that. Yeah, great coffee. Great. No, they do a great job. They do a great yeah. job. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so gosh, this has been fun. Uh, as always, we always, you know, we're always disappointed that these got to end. But yeah. let's uh, let's go to our signature question. Tell us, Rourke, uh, if I were to ask you, what's your greatest failure? And maybe what did you learn from that? I'll, uh, maybe I'll answer it a little differently than maybe somebody else as opposed to just hitting a, a, a primary failure. First of all, I'm a huge fan of failure. I, I mean, I think this is, this is the good stuff. You should be marching towards, and I do this with my kiddos, you got to be marching towards constant failure because that means you push a little too hard and you're going to learn something from it. Very few people learn a lot from wins and successes. It's the failures that help build you in a new spot. But as you ask that question, I, I can list plenty of <laughs> plenty of failures and, and what I learned, but I'll offer something hopefully maybe a little different to the kind of audience and to your listeners. And that's, um, I have a buddy that uh, makes some of the, the greatest long range shooting rifles, a lot of them kind of the, the military style rifles uh, up in Cody, Wyoming by the name of John Burns. Good buddy of mine, we become great friends. I've probably learned more about shooting from John 
in five or six years of being buddies than almost all my time in the SEAL teams, if you can piece <laughs> that together. I mean, he's just – he's a savant in the shooting world and, and just a fantastic, um, you know, human and shooter. I had – I got invited by the governor of Wyoming to go to a hunt, an antelope hunt. They have a famous hunt up in Wyoming that is called the governor's one shot. You basically hunt antelope in teams – and you get one bullet. You get one shot to get this animal. If you get the animal and harvest it, you go in the book, you go in the ledger for life as a hit. And if you miss, you go in the ledger for life as a miss. <laughs> and they tear each other up about it. So all the pomp and circumstance that goes into that hunt, it's tremendous pressure. I mean, I felt like I felt more pressure for this one shot than I did on the battlefield on almost every shot I took just to get this shot done. And the day before the actual hunt, you go out in front of like 50, 60 people. There's almost like an announcer and you take a practice shot. You take a practice shot at an antelope and I missed. I missed the practice shot. doesn't count for anything, but I missed. I rushed the shot. I kind of knew what I did, but I was a little bit upset. I remember I get back to the hotel room. I call my buddy, John, who built the rifle I'm shooting. And I was like, man, I, I, uh, I threw the shot on this thing. And, it, you know, to be honest, I'm, I, I'd be lying if I said it's not in my head about tomorrow. This is what I think I did wrong. And I started to explain it to him and he cut me off. He's like, I think you're thinking about this the wrong way. You made a mistake. You did something wrong, but I don't see how this helps us to get you to shoot well. I think instead of focusing on the failure, let's focus on those things we know you need to do well. We know you need to have sight alignment, stance, position, trigger control, follow through, breathing, all these different things that you do to get a good shot, particularly at long range. He's like, let's focus on that. Don't focus on the miss. That's just going to keep you living in a space of failure and missing. Let's focus on the number of times you did it right and know how to do it right. Just do that. And I got that. I, I mean, as soon as I hung up the phone, I was like, this is going to become one of my training principles. Let's focus on, you know, the good stuff and doing it right. Not necessarily the thing we did wrong, although there's times to address that, but I think less so than people think. And the next day I woke up, I went out there, knocked down an antelope without even thinking about it. And I'm in the books for forever as a hit. And it was like, yeah, just do the things I know to do right. Let's not focus on the failure. So I, that, that's what I'd offer up for the failure. I learned more from saying, okay, I failed. Let's concentrate on things I need to do well, not the things I did wrong that, that led to the failure. Oh, boom, we're out. That cool. is such a great, great ending message. Thanks yeah. for doing that, yeah. I, I like that.